My name is Craig Ishii. I am the executive director of an organization, a nonprofit uh, called Kizuna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, the mission of our organization is to build a future for the Japanese American community through the education, the empowerment, and the engagement of the next generation. Now the way that we do this, I'm going to just make sure, aha. Uh -huh. The way that we do this, as you can see from the slides, is we have a number of programs, a continuum, a pipeline. So we start at a young age, about age seven, uh, and I believe that we now have the largest network of Japanese American summer camps now in the nation, I think. Uh, once they finish that, they move to a host of leadership development programs for high school students. We host internship and mentorship opportunities for college <coughs> students. And we even have a board training program uh, for young adults. So the idea is that we are generating the next generation of folks to be involved. But in the work that I do, it is, of course, an inevitability, just, just like with USJC and the Emerging Leaders Program, that we are interacting with a number of different folks from Generation Y, or as we like to call millennials. And uh, millennials, as was described in one of the panels, is uh, typically early 1980s. Josh says that he was born in 1982, which is the official founding of the millennial generation. So he calls himself the founder of our millennial generation. But uh, no, we don't need to applaud for that. We don't need to applaud for that. Uh, so roughly early 1980s to late 1990s, uh, it's a generation that is now prevalent in the workforce. It's a generation that uh, loves technology. We've grown up with technology. Uh, and it's a generation that likes rapid change. We're sometimes a little bit impatient with that change, actually. But in terms of Japanese America, this world here, it's a generation that has now completed the cycle of being born and raised by our community. Uh, they're ready to be involved and to give their time, their talents, and their treasures. And that's exciting. But in addition to that, and some of our speakers are, are going to talk about that, they're also a generation that are now looking to start that cycle all over again with the beginning of their own families and the marriages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I get a, a question that's asked to me a lot um, in the work that I do. And the question is typically, uh, there's two. The first is, does the next generation want to be involved? Are they even interested? And the, sec the second question is, if so, what do you believe will be their contribution? All right, so I'm excited to introduce, we have three incredible speakers with three incredible stories. Uh, as a millennial generation, we have been blessed to receive a number of very, very, very important values as Japanese Americans. Uh, values that teach us to do things the right way, like folding my laundry the right way, like values like Chanto, right? <laughs> We've been taught values uh, which uh, force us and push us to work our hardest, values like Ishon Kenme. Uh, and we even have values that help us to push through some of the difficult times, as uh, Adam had mentioned on the panel yesterday, values like Gaman. Uh, and we carry these values with us. They shape us as individuals. It's part of our identity. But at the same time, we are also committed as a generation to carrying those values into the future. I'm not going to talk about that too much because our speakers are going to do that. Uh, and so without further ado, I am going to introduce our first guy here. <laughs> so Josh Morey is born in Los Angeles, raised in San Jose, and luckily for us is now back in Los Angeles raising his family. He's the president of the Jay Morey Insurance Company. Uh, he's a man that loves covering liability. He loves his baseball. He also has a secret talent for breakdancing, as we know. But most of we are applauding this man too much today. We are applauding this man too much. But mo most importantly, Josh is committed to the idea of carrying on the legacy of his family business, not just in his role with the Jay Morey Insurance Company, but also with his two kids, Jake and Jeremiah, two new Jay Moreys to one day potentially carry the mantle into the future. So can we give Josh a round of applause? Oh, and this is Josh and the ELP plan. <laughs> so I might own up to being the first millennial, but I don't know if I can still break dance. Well, maybe, um, maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can. I can glide sure. a little bit. Oh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> I used to be a spinner on the floor, but not anymore. Show off. Um, my name's Joshua Mori. I am a fourth generation Japanese American, and I am also a fourth generation business owner in Little Tokyo. In a lot of ways, I do identify with the millennial generation. I get my news from Twitter. I take Ubers. I don't drive as much. And I have this innate fear within me of FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. For those non-millennials here, FOMO means the fear of missing out. <laughs> so though I really do identify myself as being a millennial, I'm going to tell my story a little bit today. Um, 
in order to understand me, you have to understand my past and where I came from. If you can look at the picture here, I circled in red, it's gonna be hard to see, but that street sign says First Street in San Pedro. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see on the storefront, little corner store called the Asia Company. In 1897, my great-grandfather, Bungoro Mori, came to America and started the Asia Company in 1907. He was one of the first business owners in Little Tokyo, but not just a business owner, but a community leader. There's some publications that say that my great-grandfather was the first person to import goods, dry goods, from Japan to America at the turn of the century. So though it was a very small store to start, he did a great job in building it. This is 15 years later. Not only just the corner store, but actually one of the largest businesses in Little Tokyo called the Asia Company. And he worked really hard, again, not to just be a business leader, but also to be a community leader. And that's what our family continues to have, a physical presence in Little Tokyo and now in Japantown, San Jose. But after the war, they returned back to Little Tokyo and the Asia Company was gone. And my grandfather, George Mori, along with Bungoro Mori, tried to restart the Asia Company. And to no avail, failed and started, oops, excuse me, and started the, the Mori Company rice distributors throughout the community. Again, it kind of turned back to the little corner store distribution of rice. Um, my dad would tell me stories. The reason why they were so good at sports is because as little kids, they had to carry around rice to the neighbors and to the local stores. Um, but that's what they came back to do. And you know, over the years, that business didn't work out. And when my dad, John, and my uncles, Jack and Jim, graduated college, they decided to start the J. Mori Company, insurance agents and brokers. And that's where we started in 1980, back in Little Tokyo, again, a physical presence in the community. Started the J. Mori Company Insurance Agents and Brokers. In 1985, my dad moved us up to San Jose when he purchased Norman Mineta's insurance agency in Japantown, San Jose. And that's kind of where my story begins, is I grew up in San Jose, Japantown, Northern California. <laughs> and I, like probably many of my colleagues here that are involved in family businesses, I never aspired to take over my family business. I really never wanted to, never desired to, um, didn't think insurance was interesting in any way. I loved baseball, so my dreams and my goal was always to become a professional baseball player. And I did my best, I played in college, went to Japan for two years after college, played in Japan for a couple years. And then on the way back, coming back from Japan, I was still trying to make it either in an independent league or in a professional league. And that's when my dad sat me down and said, hey, I think it's time that you try out, at least try out our family business. And I, you know, I thought about it a lot. And you know, I think the, the values of giri, duty, really ran deep through within me. And growing up in the communities of San Jose and then also reflecting on my family's history in Little Tokyo, in the Japan towns, it was kind of a no-brainer that I at least had to give it a shot. And I think my mistake was that when my dad offered me a job, I thought I was gonna get paid a lot of money. And, <laughs> and that's probably a millennial perspective. <laughs> um, but when he offered it to me, he said, you have to do it like we did it. Like my uncles and him did it, like my grandfather did it, like my great-grandfather did it. So I started off in 2008 as a full commission-based, you know, personal lines insurance salesman and did that for two years and did okay at it and started gaining some momentum. And within two years, then my dad and uncle said, okay, now you have to start your own office, just like we did it, <laughs> just like your grandfather did it. And it was a no-brainer for me. I wanted to open up an office in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles. <coughs> if you can remember back to the picture, the first picture that I showed, First Street in San Pedro. This is not exactly First Street, it's First Street in San Pedro, but it is First Street next to, actually it's in the old museum, Japanese American National Museum building. And I do take a lot of pride that on a daily basis I can walk the same streets that my great grandfather walked 117 years ago. And I own a business in Little Tokyo. So it's, uh, I, I do take a lot of pride in that. I think that's giddy within me, my duty to carry on my family's legacy. But even beyond that, carrying on our commitment to the community and maintaining the physical presences. Even as our communities change, I think having a physical presence in the communities that our, our community still interacts in is very important. So my dad retired two years ago and 
he gave me six months before I retired and said, okay, I'm going to retire and you're going to be taking over. And that's not much leeway to try to figure out the responsibilities that I now have to maintain. Uh, but I think it's through, you know, being able to prove myself and show that I'm dedicated and I'm willing to work hard for, you know, for our family's business and the community <clears throat> that he felt comfortable to say, here you go, take it over. I'm excited for what you can do. So not so much just Giddy to carry on the legacy. I also want to blaze new futures. Uh, with it, it took 35 years for my dad and my uncles to build our insurance business to what it was. And in the past two years, we'd, we've been able to leverage technology and create partnerships in London and in Tokyo. And um, we, in two years, we doubled our book of business that took us 35 years to build. So again, it's not just maintaining. It's exponentially growing for me. And that's in the business, that's in the community, and that's, what, that's my perspective as a millennial. These are my boys. <laughs> I think my youngest son thinks that I play professional baseball as my profession, but my oldest son doesn't. But, um, <laughs> but there was a panel two days ago on Members Day for, on leadership, and Colbert Matsumoto had mentioned kodomono tamani, meaning for the sake of the children, as a leadership principle or virtue <clears throat> or value that is very important to the next generation. And that really resonated with me because everything that I do are for these boys, and I hope to have more kids as well, but it's for the next generation. So I'm even thinking about beyond my generation, but what I can leave for my kids, what my dad and my uncles are leaving for me, what my grandfather left for them, and what my great-grandfather came here and left for everybody else, too, within our family. But, th but again, it's not just to maintain. I want to exemplify it for, for, for my children what it's like to have the values of Gidi, but also to dream big and for them to even think about the next generation beyond them. Again, I told you my love is baseball, and I want to show my kids that you can do the thing that you, things that you love and that you're passionate about, and then you can create even for future generations. So two years ago as well, when I took over my family's insurance brokerage, my experiences of playing baseball in Japan kind of came full circle, and there were some players in Japan that needed help getting signed in, in America with MLB. And just by chance, they asked, well, can you help us, can you help connect us? We helped connect them, and they said, well, actually, we need an agent. Can you be an agent? And I said, like, I don't know. I've <laughs> I looked it up, and we filed an LLC and passed the MLB uh, agent test and became uh, certified MLB agents. And now we represent players coming from the MPB in Japan to play in the MLB here and also in Liga Mexicana down in Mexico. So again, I want to exemplify for my children that it's not just like what our family has done. It's what daddy can create. It's what you guys are going to create for the future. I think this is, to close my last slide, this is really important to me because this is one of the teams that we bring over every summer. And usually one or two of these guys will get signed by an MLB team or an LMB team in Mexico. But what we like to do is, this is what I love, baseball, right? And if you guys notice, this behind this picture is common ground at the Japanese American National Museum. And it's tying it back to the community through the things that I love to do. Uh, it's showing that my kids, they can do the same. And for most of these uh, students and players, it's the first time that they've ever heard about the Japanese American experience. So as a millennial, that's how I view what carrying on certain values, but also blazing new futures. You know, J Josh's kids think that he plays professional baseball because he keeps telling them, kids, I play professional baseball. <laughs> so, you know, at, at some point they're going to learn the truth. Know, but, but in all seriousness, uh, I've known Josh for a little while now. Um, I, I don't like to give him too many compliments, just as my friends don't like to give me too many compliments <laughs> either. But uh, Josh has, has been, the way he works with his family is exactly how I want to have a family one day as well. So I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been an inspiration to me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Kamei. Uh, I've known Ellen uh, before we met here at USJC. She is the dis uh, district director with the California State Assembly. Um, but in addition to that work, she also does a lot of work with the... Uh, one of the three remaining Japan towns in California, in San Jose. Uh, she has started a number of programs, worked with a number of youth there. Uh, she was part of a statewide uh, internship program 
That was also to preserve those Japan towns. And even recently, she has been part of creating a statewide giving circle to build philanthropy amongst young adults and giving back to the Japanese American community. So if you can join me in welcoming Ellen Kame. <laughs> So thank, thank you, Craig. Um, as you can tell, I've lost my voice, and I'm so sorry about that, but please bear with me. Um, good morning. My name is Ellen Kamei. My mother is Chinese and Puerto Rican, born to first-generation immigrants in New York City, and my father is Sansei, born at Heart Mountain um, internment camp in Wyoming. And for the first 15 years of my life, I grew up here on my family's nursery. Um, this is my brother Jonathan, I'm on the bike, and that's my grandfather Kenzo. And as things do come full circle, this is our dog Donatello. If you can tell, we were really into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time as I was living this life on our, on our 10 acre nursery, my parents um, were really politically engaged and civically minded. Um, here I am on my, one of my first pieces of campaign literature for my mother's race for the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. I'm in seventh or eighth grade here in the uh, top corner, and um, I hopefully this will dispel the idea that millennials don't vote. I've been wishing that I can vote since I was in elementary school, and at this point, I'm familiar with licking envelopes, stuffing letters, and I thought everyone did this. I, I, I thought everyone went to campaign events because you got to eat soda and pizza and watch TV and do all these things that I wasn't allowed to do at home. Um, but apparently as I grew up, I learned that that wasn't the case and it was very unique. Um, so my mother's name is Rosemary and I remember that we delivered uh, rosemary plants with this in them with a promise to put our environment first. And before this time, she had already been serving on the Santa Clara um, Valley Water District. And we've come a long way in two decades. I've gone from elementary school super volunteer to campaign manager. And here in this picture, it was last November, um, with my mom after she, ran, she won her race for the Santa Clara County Board of Education. Um, they say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and with my mother and I, that is definitely the case. Um, she likes to tell each other, tell people that we are sisters, um, and when, because when people meet us, they say, you're too young to have a daughter that old, and I think, well, what does that mean about me? Um, <laughs> I'm a millennial, um, and, uh, but when I was nine, my mother took me to an event for a woman who was running for the United States Senate uh, for the state of California. And I remember being really inspired and I told my mom that night, I wanna be just like her. And I had even asked for an autograph. And uh, I keep that actually framed in my, in my room. And um, it's in that way that I've realized that Ikigai, my sense, of <clears throat> my reason for being is one of service. And I realize in my career, it's public service. I've worked in city, county, federal, and now state government on the political and public administration side. And in each level of government, it's my love of helping others that's my ikigai. I enjoy trying to create a bridge between those who feel like they don't have a voice and feel like they can be heard. Um, I'm inspired by the role models that I've seen growing up. My grandfather who helped found the Mountain View Buddhist Temple to my mother who not only pursued a career in public service, raised two kids, but got her masters part-time and had a full-time job. <clears throat> they made me realize that I too can make a difference in my community for those that I care most about. Another kind of service is one to my cultural community. After moving back to California, after time here in Washington, uh, in Japan, and at the University of Pennsylvania getting my master's, I decided to get back involved with my uh, San Jose, Japan town. And as Craig mentioned, it's one of the three remaining Japan towns in the entire United States. Uh, developing the next generation of our community and cultural leaders is something I believe in because it gave me so much growing up. I was the girl going to Girl Scouts, to Judo, to Japanese summer school, and I wanted to make sure that that would exist for those who came after me. 
And now I'm on various nonprofit boards. I'm on the Japantown Community Congress, which brings the church community, the nonprofits, and the various stakeholders together. And I uh, recently, four years ago, started um, a giving circle called the New Generation Nikkei Fund, where it's three millennials in San Francisco, three millennials in San Jose, and three in Los Angeles, all trying to pull together under four, those who are under 40 um, money to give back to our communities. And over the course of four years, we've been able to donate uh, $40,000. At the last annual conference, I was able to highlight San Jose, Japantown, and my roots there. We toured the Senior Center, and we visited the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Um, and last year, San Jose, Japantown celebrated 125 years, and we are going strong. For the last five years, I've been on the City of Mountain View's Environmental Planning Commission. My family has been in, Mount, in the Mountain View area since the 1930s, and I was able to highlight our city's, uh, actually, Japanese-American roots of flower growing for Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Month. My dad participated. Uh, he's the one in the blue shirt with the not smiling face uh, right here. Um, and uh, it, it felt very full circle. Um, my father was on the panel with some of his middle school and high school classmates, and I felt that it was the third generation in Mountain View, paying homage to the first generation in Mountain View, my, my grandparents and then my dad. And it really shows that Ikigai is in every aspect of my life, and I can't wait to continue this life of service. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity and the privilege of knowing Ellen before we met at USJC. Uh, I think what is most inspirational about her is she is literally one of the hardest working people I have ever met. When you sort of have that phrase like, oh man, we see you everywhere, that is true, except that Ellen lives in San Jose and I live in Los Angeles, and yet I still see her everywhere, <laughs> right? And so uh, it's been incredibly inspirational, and I feel that the work that you've done for J-Town has really you know, made a huge impact. Our last speaker, last but not least, is Professor Christine Kitano. Uh, Christine was born in Los Angeles, but unfortunately we lost her to the East Coast. So she's now on the East Coast. She's a professor at Ithaca College, uh, and she's a published author of two books. Uh, I had, and many of our uh, folks um, that know her, had the opportunity and privilege to read her newest book that's called Sky Country, uh, which is a series of different poems, one of them that she'll be sharing today. Uh, but what, one of my favorite parts about that book is that not only is she able to give you a glimpse of what the incarceration experience was like, but she also has the emotion of what that was like and what the emotion was and the feeling was during that period, and it's incredible. But what's even more incredible is that there are also poems and stories very much from the present day, and she's able to connect those to the stories of the past so that we know that they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and that's, that's something that um, I thought was just amazing about the book. So if you can join me in welcoming Christine Catano. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I was listening to their presentations, I realized that my slide has a lot of words on it. Um, <laughs> I am a professor, and I guess it, uh, I, I thought of, it's not a lecture, okay, I promise. There are more pictures coming, but this is just to set the scene, all right? Uh, so when we were talking about this panel and thinking about the different virtues that we could talk about, I knew that I wanted to do gamon. It was the one term that I was immediately familiar with, and it was one that I didn't need to look up. But just to make sure, I was in my office, I took down the Encyclopedia of Japanese American History to make sure I knew what I was doing, and I checked the definition, and it was right. It's what I thought it meant, right, to endure, persist, persevere. Uh, but then the definition in this encyclopedia continued, and then I realized that it was quoting my father, UCLA sociologist Harry H. L. Kitano. So I wanted to start with this slide because I think it ties my story to both Josh's and Ellen's, uh, whereas they've gone into the family business in different ways. Uh, I've continued in academia, although in a different field. I'm a poet, my father was a sociologist, but I still aim to use my work in scholarship and poetry and academia to share these values with a wider audience. 
So just a little bit of background. I grew up in Los Angeles, as Craig said, and my mother is first generation Korean. She immigrated to the United States when she was 16 years old. So on that far right picture, that's me in traditional hanbok as a little girl. And then my father was Nisei, so he was older when I was born, but he had been incarcerated at Topaz. And I was really lucky to grow up in Los Angeles where I had access to both the, the Korean American culture and the Japanese American culture. And I think these photos sort of show that. I went to Bonori, Odori, I went to the Japanese American National Museum, I would dress up in kimono for, I, I don't even remember what this was, but I'm dressed up for these different cultural events. And I was lucky to have access to that. And I didn't really realize how lucky I was until I went to grad school in places like uh, Lubbock, Texas, or Syracuse, New York, uh, where those cultural values are just not present. And so I feel very lucky to have grown up knowing what gaman is and knowing these cultural ideas. So a little bit of background. My father was 15 when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. He was living in San Francisco at the time. So he spent his high school years in Topaz High School, at, in Topaz Incarceration Camp in Utah. And so this is, these are screenshots from the Topaz uh, yearbook. And so on the second page, this, the first column of photos, the guy whose head is circled in the middle, that's my father. Uh, he was voted senior class president of the Topaz High School class. And then on the far right side, uh, the top right hand corner photo, you see him, uh, you see a guy kicking his leg really up high. That's my father as well. Uh, he played for the varsity football team at Topaz High School. Uh, and I think I was lucky to hear about these stories. My father, a typical Nisei man, didn't talk a lot at home, but I was uh, allowed to go to his lectures. So from a very young age, I would go sit in on his lectures at UCLA and learn about his history and learn about the effect of the incarceration on him. And one of the things I learned about was not just the, the actual history of it, and of course we focus on the injustice and the denial of rights, but it was also this personal story that had he gone to a regular, a regular American high school, he wouldn't have been allowed to be senior class president, right? He wouldn't have been allowed to play on the varsity football team. And I think that sort of complex idea of gaman, it's not just to persevere, it's not just about patience, but it's about making the best of whatever situation that you're in. It's not ignoring the terrible situation, but still striving to uh, make a community wherever it is you are. And that was part of the idea of gaman that uh, I wanted to express in my own work. Oops. All right, so my father went on after Topaz. He uh, went to UC Berkeley. He got his PhD, and then he taught at UCLA for 36 years. And he devoted much of his academic career to studying and writing about the effects of the incarceration. So these are just some of the books that he published uh, in his lifetime that dealt with the Asian American community, the Japanese American community, and the effects, the effects of the incarceration. So as Craig, I know it's a lot of words again, but uh, so as Craig said, uh, I am a poet. Uh, I've, in my work, I want to continue the work that my father was doing. He was a sociologist, I'm a creative writer, so obviously our paths are going to be different. Uh, but I want to take these stories and make sure that they are preserved and that they reach a younger audience. Uh, this is a poem called Gaman. It is from my second collection, Sky Country, which was published last month. Uh, I'm gonna read the poem, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. For this poem, it's not directly autobiographical. I stepped outside of my personal story to imagine a speaker, so the narrator of the poem, is a young Issei mother. And I was wondering, for a young Issei mother, you give up your life in Japan, you immigrate to the United States, you start this new life, you have children, you have this family, you have this community, and then to have that taken away, so that's the first trauma in some ways. But then how do you explain that to your children? If your children ask, how did you let them do that? How do you explain where you were coming from during that moment? And so. Yeah, it was thinking about that, imagining that, that I wrote this poem, so I'll read this. Come on. It was night when the buses stopped. It was too dark to see the road, or if there was a road. So we waited, we watched, we thought of back home, how the orchards would swell with fruit, how the trees would strain, then give way under their ripe weight. The pockmarked moon, the face of an apple, pitted with rot. 
but of course not. Someone would intervene, would make of our absence a profit. When we came, the boat anchored at San Francisco Bay swayed for hours. The gauntlet of uniformed men so intent on finding cause to turn us away. And now again, we wait, we watch. Our American children press against us with their small backs, which gives us pause. For the sake of the children, we'll teach them to forgive the fears of others, the offensive. But what we don't anticipate is how the dust of the desert will clot our throats, how much fear will conspire to keep us silent, and how our children will read this silence as shame. However much we thought, we tried, we thought, to demonstrate grace. When the buses stopped, it was too dark to see the road, or if there was a road. It was night, and instead of speaking, we waited. Instead of speaking, we watched. Thank you, thank you, okay. I'm not used to being applauded for reading a poem. <laughs> uh, but in a poem like this, um, I'll just close by saying that it's hard to define a term like gaman, right? There's no direct translation. There's no direct translation for any word, really, but especially a term like gaman that is so culturally rooted. Uh, and so using a poem, I think, is a unique tool, a unique way to use language uh, to get in an experience that is otherwise unreachable or unsayable in some way. And it was through using, uh, go, working through this poem that I found my way to the word grace as a translation for gaman, which I don't think is a common translation and it's obviously imperfect. Uh, but I think part of what I want to do in my work is to enlarge our ideas of how these cultural values uh, can be translated for a wider audience. Thank you. I had a chance to get to know Christine a lot better um, by working on this panel with her. Uh, and I think that you know, as she started to put together her slides and talk about her father uh, and carrying on the legacy of, of the family, which uh, you know, from the stories you've heard today, a lot of folks, a lot of us do that. Um, that, I think, was one of the most inspirational things, right? Because we're all here for a reason. Well, I, actually, that's one of the questions I'm gonna ask them in a second, so <laughs> I'm just gonna cut myself short right here. <laughs> what we're gonna do right now is uh, we're, we're just gonna switch real quick into a, a panel format. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask two questions uh, for each of the panelists uh, that is very much related to millennials, values, carrying it on. Uh, and so we'll just go ahead and dive in. Uh, and then I'll take the clicker, too, for the last five things. So the first question is uh, for each of you, you. You've talked about the idea of, uh, of giving back to your community. And each of you have shared a story where you've given back to your community in some way. Right? But when you extrapolate your story and you look at sort of everybody in the room, everybody in our community, everyone in our generation, right? it's a big question, but my question is, what do you think will be the contribution of the millennial generation to our community? <laughs> I'll start, I guess. Um, I think just from, I guess, personal experiences, you stand on the shoulders of those before you, and I think with that, you have more opportunity and so I think what really the millennial generation can contribute to that legacy is, um, is doing things exponentially bigger and better and just for the next generation. And so kind of with the same value, but really feeling empowered and resourced to do it. Um, so I think in, I think we're talking about the next generation in our, in our communities. And uh, in my experience, Millennials are much more excited and engaged than I think that we're giving credit for sometimes. Um, and, and that might be part of the association of millennials with instant gratification. But I think um, we've, we've seen an issue, as I mentioned, with the New Generation Nikkei Fund, where we saw you know, the, our Sansei, who had been great contributors um, financially to our community, were no longer there to be the donors. And how are these programs that we care so much about going to continue? And I think we asked the question, what can we do? And that's how we des decided, you know, we're not the only ones who are asking ourselves these questions. And I think the millennial generation is gonna um, fill those gaps that they see and then expand upon it and broaden it. Uh, 
I think one of the cliches or stereotypes about the millennial generation is that they, or we, I suppose, are very sensitive, right? That's something that people say, the, the special snowflake uh, sort of thing that people <laughs> like to call my students, at least. Um, and I think that that's actually one of the strengths of this generation. It's that sensitivity and empathy. I feel like we were going in a certain direction uh, that was trying to build us into these machines, but I think that this generation is moving back towards that very human, uh, the emotional connection to other people and emotional connection to our values. Uh, so I think it is actually that sensitivity and empathy that is the strength. So bigger and better things, USJC. That's what the, uh, the millennial generation will bring to your organization as well as all the other organizations involved. The, uh, the second question is, uh, in, in each story, there was some kind of inspiration. So in Josh's case, it was, Josh, we expect you to be involved. We expect you to take over the family business. Maybe, if you'd like. Uh, and in other cases, it maybe was a, uh, a more, it was maybe a little bit more of a, a quiet lead by example, right? Or watching my, my father's lectures or, you know, being able to see, uh, you know, my mother run for office and then wanting to do the same thing. Um, so I think you have two stark contrasts, but when we look at this room, it's filled with community leaders. Uh, we all work with community leaders, but what can we as a community do to continue to ignite passion, energy, and interest in giving back to our community? from the next generation. Can we start down this way, please? I, I, are you okay with that, Christina? <laughs> uh, I think that one of the most important things we can do is encourage people, our millennials, to find out what is personally at stake for them, not just, oh, I wanna get a good grade because I wanna impress my mom, or uh, I wanna get a good job. I mean, those are all important things, but I think we wanna focus on personal stakes as well. You wanna take a class, a certain class, because you actually wanna learn more about your culture, or you actually wanna learn more about how people work. Uh, and to highlight those personal stakes, I think, is what we can do to uh, inspire the next generation. So, um the next gener I think the way to expire the next generation is um, having those uh, that every interaction that you have with someone can mean something to them. And it doesn't have to be this really large thing. It can be a small conversation. And an example that I like to use with my, uh, on one of the boards I sit in in Japantown is we had uh, someone come and intern with us who loved our internship so much. The next year they did an internship at the senior center and we had talked about, I did the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, and the more he thought about it, he's like, I wanna be in Japan helping um, the older generation, um, and then went off and took a job after college to go do that. And it was just you know, a, an internship, a conversation that led to a career path. And I think in, in those little ways, um, giving someone your card, going to that coffee, um, kind of letting that spark of a relationship happen, um, can really change the course of, of people's lives. And I think that's the way to inspire is, maybe it doesn't need to be so big and intangible, but it can be very personal. Yeah, and um, I think back at the people that inspired me, and um, you know, growing up, my dad purchased uh, Norman Mineta's insurance agency in 1985, and I think Norman Mineta has always been and I mean, probably to many of us here, an incredible inspiration. And I think it's being able to have people that are really blazing new paths, whether they know it or not. I mean, I mean there's many people in this room that I personally look up to that I probably have never even met. And you got, I, I, hopefully I do get to meet um, each one of you. But I think it, you, everyone inspires everyone. And I think collectively as we synergize together, we become a bigger inspiration and especially as you know, for my kids, I think I want them to have a greater opportunity. And that is a value I think that's been passed down through, through the generations. Well, why did you point at me when you said your kids? It, it's, yeah, it's still like, well, you said that, never mind. <laughs> um, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and close it out. We're gonna finish uh, just a little bit early uh, today. Uh, I wanna thank our three panelists for speaking. Um, but. What I wanted to do is just kind of quickly sort of wrap up and synthesize everything that was said. Uh, and I feel like I can do that in about four words. Uh, the first word is past, second word is present, the third word is future. And I'm gonna save the fourth word, I'll let you kind of be in suspense for a second. Uh, but you know, as, as all of our speakers talked about, it is the achievements 
It's the time, it's the building, it's the foundation of the past that allows us in the present to have successful lives, to think about our jobs, our families, our identities. But because of all of that, in the present, we're also able to dream for the future. We're also able to think about the future for our families or our potential families <laughs> one day, right? But we had talked about cultural values. Uh, Josh had mentioned giri, or moral obligation. Uh, Ellen had mentioned ikigai, which uh, Dave Boone, if you're in the room, thank you also for imparting that to our Emerging Leaders program. Christine had also talked about the idea of enduring or gaman. But there is a fourth word that I think weaves together past, present, and future, and it is a cultural value. The word is kancha, and it's gratitude, it's appreciation. Uh, and I think that it is gratitude that helps this generation recognize that we stand on the shoulders of the generations who have come before. It is gratitude that is the everyday fuel and gasoline that powers us to do our work. And it is gratitude that has given us the lifetime commitment to give back to our community, right? And so when I think about and when we think about the contribution of this generation, it's not relegated to a specific organization, a specific event, or a specific program. But instead, it's pervasive. It's the setup of what I call systems of legacy or this concept of the ongoing passing on of organizations, values, everything that we do from this generation to the next, to the next, and to the next. So it's been wonderful being here. We appreciate uh, you having us. Thank you very much.